Okay, well, welcome along to the webinar today on uh, on-farm grain storage aeration cooling. Um, plan today to have a look at the reasons why we would look at aeration cooling, what we're aiming to do with it, um, and then how we would achieve it. What do we need to actually do aeration cooling? What airflow? Um, what time of the day do we need to run fans? What sort of fans do we need um, to achieve aeration cooling? So let's kick off. Um, as I said, if you've got questions along the way, please feel free to type them in the Q&A window um, and, and we'll do our best to answer them along the way. I'd like to thank the Birchip Cropping Group for hosting the webinar today. Um, and for those of you who don't know, my name is Chris Warwick. I'm a consultant based down in Horsham, Victoria, and I manage the GRDC's Grain Storage Extension Project. So my role is uh, coordinating that project nationally and delivering grain storage information uh, to the GRDC's southern region and a little bit into the north into New South Wales. Um, let's get stuck into it, eh? Why bother with aeration cooling? What are we trying to do? Um, one of the common misunderstandings I hear doing workshops around the country is people think aeration cooling is to kill insects. We're trying to kill them. In actual fact, we're trying to prevent them. We want to um, slow down their reproductive uh, cycle with aeration cooling to a point where we can even stop them from reproducing. But to kill a live adult uh, insect with aeration cooling is actually pretty difficult. You, you'd have to get it down to freezing temperatures for, for quite a long time. So I put aeration cooling in under the prevention heading for aeration storage. Um, so we're trying to prevent the insects. And these tables show that, um, you know, if we take grain off the paddock at our typical harvest temperatures, so the ambient conditions might be 30 to 40 degrees typically in the paddock, we can expect our grain is going to be at that same ambient conditions, the same ambient temperature. Um, and at 30 to 40 degrees, it's really ideal conditions for insects to breed and for mould also. So the cooler we can get that grain, as soon as we get it into storage, um, the, the, the quicker we slow down the development of mould and insects to a point where if we can get it down to 18 to 20 degrees, young insects stop developing and, and some even stop breeding. Down to 15 degrees, most insects can't reproduce and mould even stops developing. Uh, so that's, that's the target. That's what we're trying to do. Um, if we look at the... the, the um, the illustration to the to the bottom right of the screen we also look at moisture we take that into account as well as just temperature of the grain so ideally we've got moisture down here at 12 and a half percent or less and temperature under 20 degrees and, and we've got that as a green zone so that's the ideal storing conditions for uh, for grain as soon as we start venturing outside of that either moisture above 12 and a half or temperature above 20 degrees we start to give mold and insects more ideal conditions um, to, to develop. So um, the closer we can get, basically, the, the moisture down, the temperature down, um, the less chance we're going to have of mould or, or insect issues. Put that into a bit more detail. There's, there's five main grain storage pests that we commonly see in Australia. Um, th these, these are the, the ones we see, the, the, the brucid, the sawtooth, the rust red flower beetle lesser grain borer and the rice weevil. They're pretty common uh, around the place from what we see. These are the temperatures at which those insects can't reproduce. So if we can get grain, you can see there, down to 20 degrees, three of these insect species can't actually reproduce. They stop breeding. The lesser grain borer is a bit harder, down to 18 degrees to stop them breeding. And the rice weevil, uh, we need to get the temperature down to 15 degrees to stop them reproducing. Even if we can't achieve that straight away or you know, we may not have an automatic controller to get the grain temperature right down that, that low, even if we get the temperatures down towards these, these sort of targets, we'll slow that reproductive cycle right down. So instead of being able to reproduce in, in perhaps four weeks, um, complete a life cycle, well, these insects won't be able to complete a life cycle in anywhere near that quickly. So we slow down the whole reproductive um, time frame for each insect put that in perspective for us. Um, this was some research done um, by DAF in Queensland. Starting with 100 insects, they put 100 insects in a parcel of grain, 
and then come back again and counted how many insects there were after eight weeks at various temperatures. So they had a parcel of grain, they put the, the lesser grain borer here on the, on the left, put him in. After eight weeks at 35 degrees, there was 31,500 insects in that parcel of grain. So the 100 insects quickly turns into 31,000. Cool that grain down to 20 degrees, and you can see the 100 insects has still turned into 12,000 but it's less than half as, as much as, as, as 35 degrees. So it slowed the reproductive system down significantly. Compare that to the rice weevil, sorry, the, the flat grain beetle on the right here, flat grain beetle, which we know stops reproducing at 20 degrees, and this really demonstrates it. So we start with 100 insects. At 20 degrees, after eight weeks, we've still got 100 insects. They haven't been able to reproduce. If we'd have left that grain come off the header at 30 to 35 degrees, um, put it into storage, and there was some insects in there, after eight weeks, we've got 24, 25,000 of those insects happily breeding away. And, and they'll, of course, you know, 100 insects in eight weeks has turned into 25,000. Um, imagine after eight weeks, the 25,000 multiplying out exponentially. So you can see how, with warm temperatures, insect numbers just really flourish. That's what we're trying to do with aeration cooling, slow that life cycle down even to a point where they stop breeding. Not just about insects, but also looking at grain quality. Um, some research done quite a while ago, uh, which I'd love to update, but it looks at wheat germination, and this is wheat at 12% moisture content. Wheat stored at 20 degrees, germination after 12 months, is maintained very well at 20 degrees. But that same wheat stored at 30 degrees, germination really starts dropping off after about six months. So people often think about um, you know, looking after their grain they're going to sell, but we also need to look after the grain that we're storing for seed and be mindful that um, storing at cooler temperatures will maintain that grain germination for a lot longer. And that may be as simple as, um, you know, often our seed storage is the older silos out the back that you know, maybe fill bins that, that don't have aeration cooling. Um, so what we can do with our seed storage is pick the time of day that we harvest our seed. We might choose, if we can, if, it, if it's logistically possible, harvest our seed at a cooler time of the day. Um, if that grain goes into storage at 20 degrees rather than 35 degrees, it will hold that temperature um, for a very long time. So. Um, you know, even if we don't have a, a great aeration cooling system for our seed storage, we can put the grain in there cooler and that, that gets us starting off on the right foot. Aeration flow rate. So I often hear people get confused about aeration cooling and aeration drying. And I want to just explain the difference because it's, it, it is a very different purpose, very different system and setup to do aeration cooling versus aeration drying. So aeration cooling the, the first and most significant difference is the, is the flow rate of air. So aeration cooling, we're talking about two, even to four litres of air per second per tonne. So for every tonne of grain we've got in storage, we need two to four litres of air per second. If we want to do drying, we actually need upwards of 15 litres of air per second per tonne. So it's a significant amount more air. And that's simply because if we're wanting to carry moisture out of that grain, we need a great volume of air to be able to physically carry the moisture from one grain, past the next grain, past the next one, and right out the top of the silo. So we just need volume of air primarily to be able to carry moisture out. For aeration cooling, don't need anywhere near those volumes of air. So first thing to understand is if you're going to set up for aeration, don't expect that you get your one system is going to be able to do both. Um, even even people putting aeration cooling on thinking that they might double their capacity to do drying. It's, it's still not going to be anywhere near enough air for drying. It's, it really is a quite a different, different setup. Um, we can talk about drying a bit more another day. But aeration cooling, you can achieve with relatively low um, flow rates. Something to be mindful of is when you're getting specced up for aeration cooling, if you've got a system that might be... Um, you know, spec'd up to do four litres of air per second per tonne in wheat. 
and you then go and put canola or lentils or something like that, a smaller seed in the silo, expect your aeration system is going to be working against much higher back pressure with those smaller grains. So you won't achieve your four litres of air per second per tonne anymore. You might be back to two litres. So be mindful of that too when you, you, if you're looking at storage. If you get a system that's spec'd up to do two litres of air per second per tonne in wheat, and you go and put canola or lentils or something smaller seed in there, um, your capacity is going to drop back quite quite significantly. So be be mindful of that too. The ocean cooling process. So how's it all work? What how do we we know we've got to get the cool, the grain cool, stop the insects from breeding, slow them down. How do we actually do that? The, this is what the controllers do, the automatic controllers for aeration cooling. So if we're doing it manually, um, this is what we're trying to replicate. So as soon as the grain goes into storage, we want to turn the fans on. As soon as the grain covers the aeration ducts in the silo, however it might be, as soon as that grain is covered the aeration ducts, we turn the fans on and we run them for at least three to five days. If it's a big flat bottom silo, even longer, I'd run them continuously for a week. What we're trying to do there is flush the hot harvest temperature out of the grain and really even out the temperature. Um, you know better than me, the grain will go into, in, into storage, there'll be some grain in there at 20 degrees, some grain in there at 35 degrees, there'll be some at um, low moisture, some at high moisture, different parts of the paddock. So what we're trying to do in that first stage is even out the grain, provide uniform conditions, prevent any hot spots in there. So even if the temperature outside is quite hot, you think, oh, why would I pump 35 degree air into my, my silo for aeration cooling? Well, in the initial stages, we do want to do that. We want to just flush that harvest heat out and really, really create uniform conditions inside the, the, the bulk of grain. Once we've done that, and you can tell if it's safe to get up to the top of the silo, if you haven't done it before, turn the fans on and smell the air coming out the top of the silo and you'll one of the best uh, descriptions I've had for that is someone said it smells like wet socks, dirty wet socks, and it does. It's, it's really not a great smell. After your, about your five days or a week, you'll notice the air coming out the top of the silo smells fresh. It really changes. So you know that you've got the first um, uh, cooling front or, or, or um, front of air gone through the grain to even out those, those conditions inside the grain. The next phase, um, some of the controllers call it rapid mode. What we're aiming to do there is, is try and pick off about the coolest 12 hours for the day for the next week. And, and what we're trying to do there is pull the grain temperature from our probably mid 30s, harvest temperature, down to our mid 20s. And we need a long run time to do that. Um, one of the mistakes people make uh, when they're trying to operate cooling fans manually is that they get too selective too soon and they, and they think oh, I'll try and pick two hours tonight and, and a couple of hours the next night because it's you know I'll try and pick the coolest couple of hours of the night each night um, and they even get fancy and put uh, little timers on their switches and everything what happens is we tend to cool the grain at the bottom of the silo those two hours of air air run time we cool the grain at the bottom of the silo but if we don't have enough runtime, we don't actually push that cooling front right through the stack of grain and out the top. So we need long run times initially to do that, to push the, the cooling front right through the top of top of the to, to the top of the stack. The other thing we we know is that the grain itself, each kernel, we can cool the outside of that kernel pretty quickly, like in two hours bit of airflow past the grain you'll cool the outside of the grain but the internal part of each kernel of grain will actually still be quite warm and that will keep um, it, it will take a while for that warmth to actually get to the outside of the grain and be then cooled by the air going past it. so long run run times for the fans for the, for the second stage is the key point there after that then we start to get a bit more specific and trying to pick about the coolest 24 hours a week or 100 hours a month is what the controllers aim for and we call that someone call it maintenance mode so we're trying to bring the temperature from our probably mid 20 degrees down under 20 degrees is what we're trying to do with that maintenance mode so then we've got to get a bit more selective with our air we might pick 
shorter run times. But again, if you can have a look through, if you're doing it manually again, um, try and pick an, a night of the week that you're going to be able to get 10, 12 hours of run time. That seems to be more efficient than, than the fans running for one hour, two hours each night. Um, as, as well as trying to cool that grain down, even when we've got the grain cooled right down under 20 degrees, 18 degrees, we might think, oh, well, we've reached our temperature, we'll turn the fan off. We actually want to keep the aeration cooling process continuing on maintenance mode because, again, you'll know as well as I do, that grain in the headspace of the silo and, and probably on the northern wall of the silo um, will start heating up again with the sun. You get hot ambient conditions, that northern wall will start heating up, the grain in the headspace will start heating up. So we actually have to keep the fans going. Every now and then, turn the fans on to flush that heat out of the headspace and flush the heat away from that northern wall um, to keep the whole bulk of the grain cool again. That doesn't take much, but it's just, just flushing that, um, that heat out again. Obviously, if the ambient air, uh, if it gets above 85% relative humidity um, for too long, we need to turn the fans off. If it's above 85% RH, we will um, we'll, we'll start introducing, potentially introducing a bit of moisture around uh, the bottom part of the silo, around that aeration duct. So you know, if, you, if you miss it every now and then and it's, it's above 85%, don't panic, but we certainly don't want to be running the fans for long run times um, if, if the ambient's above 85%, like foggy weather or, or misty rain or something like that, we don't want to run those fans. Um, you can see the demonstration, the illustration here too. Um, something else we need is good ventilation. Obviously, we're pumping air in the bottom of the silo. We need a way to vent the air out the top. So either having a lid cracked open or, or a vent for the air to get out the top. Um, that's a pretty obvious one. We, we certainly don't want condensation forming in the top of the silo there and then dripping down um, onto our grain. Ducting for venting. Okay, how do we set up the silo to actually um, to do aeration? First of all, we need some, some ducting to get the air into the silo. Um, two photos here for a start, flat bottom silos. Um, the recommendation, the, the, the preferred option I would like to see um, for flat bottom silos is actually trench aeration. You've probably seen silos out there with full floor aeration. You've got a, a false floor, it's fully perforated floor. Um, they, they're actually quite difficult to clean out under those full floor um, aeration systems. A trench style like this, you can lift that trench up and clean out under that for hygiene. So the, 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 the preferred option I, I would like to see is either a V or a H um, under, the, under the bottom of the silo in, in trench style aeration. In a cone bottom silo, um, it can be as simple as, as this perforated tubing. Um, this is quite a large, big cone bottom silo, so they've got two, um, but a smaller silo one would be fine. It's a matter of mounting the fan underneath the cone of the silo um, with, with a little hood like this, and then, uh, and then a perforated tubing um, for the air to get into the silo there. One of the, the good things I like about this system, it's very simple, it's easy to install if you want to retrofit aeration cooling to your silo. Um, and the other, th the other thing I really like about it is this perforated tube just slides out of the housing so it makes it really easy to clean. So good option there. There's some th good ducting options. Obviously we're pumping air into the silo as I said we've got to be able to let that air get out again. So some, some good vents on the roof of the silo. You can see that there's some vents here um, designed so that they can be open all the time and, and venting even if it's raining outside. Um, you'll be able to leave those open if you need to, to, to let the grain breathe. Um, the other clever thing this, in, in this photo is they've actually positioned the vents beside the walkway, beside the ladder. Really clever idea. If those vents ever get stuck and you can't close them when they need to be sealed up for fumigation or, or for something else, we need to replace a rubber on them or fix them up somehow. Um, beside the, the, the ladder there, you can access them quite easily. But if you've got these vents spread right around the edge of the silo, you've got to get some way to, um, to be able to access them when you need to for maintenance. Rightio. 
back to a bit more detail, a bit more graphs. Aeration cooling versus non-aerated grain. This one's just to demonstrate how long grain will hold its temperature for. So we've got grain here on the orange line. It's gone into storage at uh, mid 30 degrees um, in December. Right through even to February, we're still above 30 degrees. It's held its temperature very well. Compared to aerated grain, gone in at mid 30s, within just a couple of weeks, that grain's dropped down to low 20s, mid to low 20s. And within a month, we're down just tipping under 20 degrees there. By February, we're well under 20 degrees. So that's what aeration cooling can do. It really does, it's quite a quick process to, to get that harvest temperature out and then to, to, to cool it down under 20 degrees takes a bit longer. But you can see the difference between aerated versus non-aerated there, the orange and the blue line. Picking the right air for cooling. The, the, ne the next thing I'm going to talk about is, is aeration controllers again. Um, you might be watching this thinking, yes, that's all well and good, Chris. I'd love to get an aeration controller, but um, can't afford one just at the minute. So I'm going to have a go at running fans manually. That's fine. Um, what you need to understand is that it's not just about picking the right temperature air, but it's also the right relative humidity air. So take, for example, grain at 12% uh, relative, 12% uh, moisture content. Uh, of wheat in this example. Say we've got 12% moisture content and we've got ambient conditions at 25 degrees. We say, okay, that's, uh, that's all well and good. I'll pick that air up at 25 degrees. If that air outside is 25 degrees and 75% relative humidity, the grain temperature inside the silo we can expect is actually about 28 degrees. That's because we've got we actually got reasonably cool air, but it's fairly damp air, uh, and we don't get anywhere near as good cooling effect. Pick that same temperature air, 25 degrees, but if the relative humidity is low, down at 30%, so we've got cool, dry air, the temperature inside the silo we can expect is 20 degrees. So by getting cool, dry air, we get a, an evaporative cooling effect going on inside that, that grain storage. So that's something to be aware of if you're looking at running fans manually yourself, you need to pick cool, dry air. Even if you've got a controller, you might hear the controller on one day and think, oh, you know, it's not that, um, you know, it might be 30 degrees outside. You think, wow, it's 30 degrees, that fan shouldn't be on. But if it's very dry, 30 degrees and 30% and, and relative humidity, you will be achieving 24 degrees inside that silo. So, be aware that it's not just about temperature, temperature and humidity combined. The controllers actually figure that out and they use a wet bulb equivalent um, to, to, to pick the right air, the most efficient air for cooling. This is a graph of what they do, a, a controller, um, um, an example there on the left, but this controller um, was set up on a lab just to see what it does. You can see here it's gone on for a few days. It hasn't had any really good conditions but but the controller said well i need to flush that hot air out of the headspace in the northern wall so i'll run the fan for a couple of hours a few more days gone past and it still hasn't got good conditions so it's, it's turned the fans on again for a couple of hours a few days later it's got a bit better conditions so it's turned the fans on for 13 hours um, to, to try and pick off those conditions but you can see through that it really hasn't changed the grain temperature this green line by doing those short run times it hasn't taken a lot of temperature out of the grain. Then we get a cool front come through and the controller says, beauty, I'll pick that up and I'll get 35 hours run time. And you can see that's really had an effect on our grain temperatures, brought it down quite quickly. Um, and then again, it's gone back to its, uh, its little maintenance mode of hasn't, hasn't run for a few days, I'll give it a couple of hours to, to flush that, that, that uh, heat out of the headspace. So that's the sort of um, things that the automatic controllers do for us um, without us having to think about it or, or trying to pick the relative humidity and, and temperature um, to get the, the most efficient air. Key points on, on aeration cooling, it's a big topic, there's a lot of detail, but um, hopefully this has given you a bit of a snapshot today. Um, the first thing about aeration cooling I really want you to understand is that what we're trying to do is slow the insect development and prevent mold. 
Um, that, that's the key, the key thing we're trying to do with aeration cooling. Um, and, and as well as maintaining the grain quality and seed viability. Um, for things like pulses, um, what we know is the cooler they're stored, the better they actually maintain their colour as well. So, um, so, so aeration cooling can have benefits there for, for grain quality. Um, canola, we know it, it helps maintain the, the, the quality of canola very well, having it stored cooler. Aim for less than 18 degrees, make that your target. If you can get it cooler, that, that's even better. But most places in Australia, with an automatic controller, um, we see results less than 18 degrees very regularly um, through the autumn time. So don't expect that um, you need to go out and get um, fancy cooling, you know, uh, evaporative cooling systems or, or, um, or air conditioner systems to, to cool the grain down. We can do it simply with aeration cooling. We can achieve the temperatures that we're trying to target here. Ducting and ventilation is important. Obviously, if we're putting air in the bottom of a storage, we've got to be able to have a way for the air to get out at the top. We don't want to add any back pressure to that fan. So having good ventilation at the top is, is important. The cooling process, most efficiently done with automatic controllers. Um, so I encourage you to look at that. Um, if not immediately um, for your storage setup, certainly set your storage up that you can add a controller down the track. Um, you'll, you'll soon get sick of trying to pick the, the most efficient air out um, to, to do your cooling. So plan to put a controller in in the future, if, if not straight away. More information, um, storedgrain.com.au, of course. Um, there's a really good little fact sheet on aeration cooling. It's got some videos there as well um, to, to help explain aeration cooling. There's another book that goes into a bit more detail about um, both aeration cooling and aeration drying. Um, so that's a good resource there. Of course, the, the hotline 1800 Weevil will put you in touch with your nearest grain storage specialist, um, or you can shoot me an email at info at storedgrain.com.au. I can't see any questions coming in, so I might, um, I might call that the end of the, the webinar today. Thank you very much for coming along, for joining in. Um, if you do have questions, feel free to stay on and type them in or, or contact us. Um, via the, the, the 1800 Weevil or the website there, storedgrain.com.au. Um, and all the best for harvest and, and the new year.